Welcome everyone. Vox Day, Info Galactic, and voxday.blogspot.com. That's been a while, a couple of weeks I think. So sorry, I've been uh, just been busy uh, working on two big game projects, um, working on Info Galactic, and of course. Um, Keeping up with uh, keeping up with the editing, <laughs> we had a bit of a we had a bit of a crunch there for a while. Um, the we've got uh, no gods only demons coming out very soon, and uh, city of corpses coming out very soon, and uh, I'm a bit behind still on SJW's always double down, um, but I've been, I've been working on that. It has been a while. Um, you know, I've I've uh, I've realized that, um, you know, I just have to try to carve out the time to do it, um, and also keep them maybe a little bit shorter, keep them to more like twenty minutes or so. Um, it's easy to get distracted, and it's easy to you know try to cover too much ground in a single one. So uh, I'd rather do it more reliably, um, you know, five or six times a, a week, and and keep them. You know, keep them to about 20 minutes or so. So we're going to try to do that. Um, I'm also, <laughs> yeah. Um, I've just been really busy, to be honest. We have a we have a large um, we have a large game project that we're doing, um, and then we have a smaller game project that um, some of you may have uh, remember. I was getting questions for the, for that that uh, trivia game called Game Brain. And we've made a lot of, of headway on that. Um, we're, we're hitting about 2,000 questions now. Uh, we've got the graphic interface designed. We've got the multiplayer uh, in process. And so um, I think it shouldn't be probably sometime in May we'll be, um, we'll be testing that. Another big development that uh, you may not be aware of, but if you go to infogalactic.com, uh, you may have to refresh once or twice on the main page, but what you'll see is that we now have advertisements from good old games up there. Now, I don't know how many of you are clients of good old games or buy games from good old games, but we would, uh, we would encourage you to uh, sign up. The next time that you buy games through GOG, do it through the affiliate link at Infogalactic, and um, and so if you go through, obviously if you go through Infogalactic, um, then that will generate you know a small percentage of, of whatever you buy from GOG will come to Infogalactic. So that's a, that's a great way to help. Um, I'll be I'll be sending out an alert to the BFM who helped us out recently um, to let them know about that. We j literally just got that up on the web page now. And uh, you'll see what we're going to do is all of those, um, all the different pages about, uh, about computer games and video games are going to have uh, ads for the current good old game sale going up there every week. So um, you know, you'll be able to see what's going on. I mean, obviously, if you're, if you're, a, if you're like me, you probably just get their alerts in your email. But in case you don't see them, um, you'll see them on all the pages. Uh, and, and eventually, we're, we're working with their API. We're going to work, get work, uh, we're going to tie the pages in more closely to the API. So for example, if you go to um, the page about Fantasy General, it'll link to the strategy game pages and, and that sort of thing. So, um, so you know, we, we've been very busy. Obviously, um, Forkbot is also coming along. So, um, very soon, you know, very very soon, um, we will be completely up to date with Wikipedia at all times on all pages that we haven't uh, that our editors haven't modified. But you know, there was a, a tweet from um, there's a tweet from Mark Levine uh, today. And, you know, one thing, one area that we need your help is just getting the word out about Infogalactic. You know, Levine is complaining about, 
uh, the way that the leftists are, um, you know, vandalizing his page essentially. And he said, well, when, when, are, when are they going to stop being able to do this on Wikipedia? And the answer is never, absolutely never. That's, what, that's why Infogalactic exists. You know, I spent plenty of time um, paying attention to, you know, what Wikipedia was saying here and there. And it was very obvious to me that there was never, ever going to be any balance. The kind of people who are the Wikipedia admins are people like that Antifa professor. You know, those type of people, the same type of people who are running around demonstrating the Antifa are the same sort of people who are Wikipedia admins. They're basically low-level academics at fourth and fifth rate institutions. And they're very, very hardcore. Um, yes, I do know about Jimmy Wales, and Jimmy Wales is, is very much an SJW. So that's why uh, he's surrounded himself with SJWs. They will never change it, ever. And so, um, you know, it, it's, that's why it's, it's vital for them to support it. Um, average IQ of my typical listener. Uh, well, you got to keep in mind that, that there's a lot more people at 100 than there are at 115 or so. Um, and certainly, I've seen plenty of people... Um, attempting to make arguments or, uh, you know, even supporting the arguments that I've made, um, but doing so in a less than entirely effective manner. So, you know, I, I would guess that um, the average IQ would probably be around 110, somewhere in that, in that area. But that's much higher than, than you would tend to think. For one thing, the average IQ in the United States is no longer 100. You know, that's, the, that's pretty much the average white IQ in the United States. But the United States now, you know, in conservative, I think I, we estimated it in conservative, but, you know, um, you know, I estimated that the average IQ in the United States has fallen by about somewhere between four and eight points. And that's one reason why our infrastructure and everything is breaking down. And so... Um, you know, so, it, you know, one of the most important factors in a, uh, in defining what a society is like is the average IQ. It's not the number of high IQ people you have. There's not enough of us to really matter. You know, if you've only got a few very high IQ folks, then um, what you need, then, you know, they're not, they can't influence the society. And so... Um, you know, you need more people that are, you know, the 150 crowd, the 130 crowd, uh, I mean, you know, anything over 130, it tends to be largely irrelevant to the current society because those of us who are in the, you know, 150 range or so have a very limited ability to influence people. We can't talk to people. There's what they call the, the two standard deviation IQ gap. Um, what I mean by largely irrelevant is, for example, I will never be as influential as somebody who is more able to speak to the average intelligence. You know, I just, I just don't have that ability. I try to dumb down my column back when I was nationally syndicated. And as the editor said, um, you know, great, you've, you've now reduced it from, you know, instead of it being seven years over their, their target, it's now five years over their target. And so it's not, it's not going to work. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's basically, you know, they did, they actually did a study that was, um, they did a study that uh, showed that the most successful people um, are generally in the range between 120 and 130-ish. There's very, very few, I mean, it was really remarkable. They studied um, academics at the, at, 
at the some of these elite institutions, you know, the professors and stuff. And you would think these are, you know, supposedly brilliant academics and everything, right? Well, they they they, they tested them, and they averaged around 130. Now that's not that's not bad. That's quite smart. It's two you know two standard deviations, but um, you know it, it's 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 not that it's not highly intelligent. It's it's not particularly intelligent, and so um, I mean yeah, but I mean it is, but you know it doesn't it doesn't compare to the 150s to the 175s and that sort of thing, and so um, you know and, and it's very very difficult. What what people don't understand that is difficult for the highly intelligent is that, uh, and the reason, one reason why we piss so many people off is because we don't know at what point you stop understanding what we consider to be obvious. And so I'm frequently, up, you know, whenever people say, I want you to explain something to me, um, I tend to start at the very beginning. And then people get pissed. So they're like, well, of course I know. That, well, I don't even understand. I don't understand why you don't get the whole thing. You know, to me, I'm looking at it going, this is this is intrinsically obvious. How, how do you not get that? And so, uh, you know, it's just like, I mean, think about a, a really difficult math problem. And um, <laughs> I'll give you an example. Uh, no, I mean, it, it's um, I, I've, I've written about this stuff. Just look it up on, on the blog. I, I think I, I gave some examples there. Um, one of the things that I, one of the things that I was um, talking about was the difference between you know somewhere around 145 IQ. I think they said people begin to to fundamentally think in a very different way. It's kind of a more holistic um, snapshot manner. You know, that that's how I often tend to think, and. Uh, but there's a big difference between that and thinking like normal people, but only doing so uh, quicker and more effectively. People tend to think about intelligence as being speed, speed of processing. And there is truth to that. There's definitely truth to that. There's a reason why speed reading tends to be associated with high intelligence. It's because, it's because the, the brain is able to, you know, process more quickly. It's just like a, a faster CPU on a computer. But past a certain point, there tends to be, you know, I, I divide it into what I call very high, I, I, very high IQ and ultra high, I, I, high IQ. The, the ultras just fundamentally think differently than the, the very high IQ folks. And so, but, but, but you have to keep in mind that many, many people think that they're smart and they're not entirely wrong you know when, when you're when, when you think about you know sort of the average you know annoying prick online uh, you know the kind of atheist who goes in and starts talking about how he fucking loves science or uh, you know coming in with these these generic arguments about there not being a god or, or whatever um, the they're usually in like what, what, I, what I call the midwit range. They're, they're like 105, 110 IQ. And the thing is, they believe that they're very smart. They think they're smarter than everyone else because they are smarter than most of the people around them. You know, they've been told all their lives that they're smart. They've done well in school. They get good grades. You know, they're... They're not actually stupid. I mean, for me, you know, I, I find them particularly annoying because I can barely see any difference between them and normal people, but they're running around posturing and, and, and trying to tell, you know, tell people that, it, tell people that they're stupid and all that sort of thing. And it's, it's just ridiculous. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, one of the, the things that I just often do to, to, resolve the question and just say, you know, look, are you in Mensa? Or are you Mensa capable, eligible? And, you know, 95% of the time, they're not. They, they, they think Mensa is really, really high. It's not. It's just the top 2%. Um, 
And then the next question, of course, is, are they national merit? Anyone who is truly intelligent in the United States is national merit. Hillary Clinton was national merit. Obama was not. That's one, one way that we knew there's no way he was any sort of genius. Or, you know, or what they call genius IQ. I don't believe that, that I, I believe genius is accomplishment. It's not, you have to do something to be a genius, not just, um, no, absolutely necessarily. Don't, don't get into this with me. I know what school Obama went to. My mother went to the same school. Everyone who went there took the SATs. He absolutely took the SATs. He absolutely did not qualify for national merit. And so, um, so the point is that I'm not interested in you and we're not talking about you. Um, but, the, um, but the point is, is that it's a very good way of distinguishing between that. Well, I mean, the gulf between 135 and 150, it's a whole standard deviation right there. I mean, that's the difference between, um, you know, someone who's like, you know, a, a lawyer and somebody who's, who's just not. And so, um, no, Hillary actually, you're wrong. Uh, Hillary is actually quite bright. And, and again, this is, this is getting back to what I was citing before. The very successful lawyers are not the smart ones. The very successful lawyers are the ones who are in that sweet spot, that sort of 120 to 130 range. Why? Because of what they call, what I referred to as the two standard deviation communications gap. You know, the, about the smartest that you can be and still communicate very effectively with normal people is to be just below the Mensa level. I mean, there's a reason why we have this stereotype of Mensa caliber minds being losers and nerds and, and totally, totally hapless. And so it's, uh, it's because they can't communicate effectively with normal people, you know? Um, I mean, yes, I can, to a certain extent, communicate effectively with normal people, but that's a learned behavior. You know, it's not something, if I were to communicate naturally, it would not make a whole lot of sense. No, it, it's, not, it's not the vocabulary that's used. It's basically the um, leaping from one subject to the next based on connections that you see that other people don't. And so when, when, you, see, when you see two very, very smart people talking, what you'll often see is they tend to speak in short bursts and incomplete sentences. So basically, it's it's just the you know when I'm when I'm talking to with my best friend who's you know got a hundred and fifty IQ, um, you know we tend to switch between either lecture mode, where one person is sort of informing the other, or this sort of um, burst communication, and so um, it's just a very it's just a very different um, means of communicating. And so um, I, I think my writing fiction has helped because I had the same problem with fiction. You know, I'm not a good fiction writer. I don't have that talent that, um, you know, someone like a John Wright or Bruce Bethke or one of those folks have. I mean, they just, um, I don't know what his IQ is, but he was very smart. I met him twice. Um, I had the opportunity to spend a whole day with him once. And he was, um, you know, he was, he was really fascinating because he, he was above all a teacher. He was an excellent teacher. And what was interesting was when we started talking, when I was interviewing him, he immediately recognized that I had a, uh, you know, I wouldn't say an intellect at his level, but at least, uh, you know, at a level that was, was close enough to his. And he was almost angry with me. You know, when I was asking him questions, he was coming back hard. At one point, I said something about, 
um, about one of his characters who most people would consider to be the villain. And I use the term villain in, in, in reference to him. And he came back hard and almost angrily saying, you know, why are you calling him a villain? He's not a villain, he's a hero. <laughs> and it's like, well, he is the murderer and he you know, did burn down the, the precious library and so forth. Um, but, but what was funny was that so, but it was just, it was fascinating to see the difference between his, the way that he was talking with me about um, the name of the rose and some of the philosophical aspects of that, God laughing and so forth, um, which by the way, I disagree with his point. But, um, but then he had this, this uh, young college girl that we went up to this uh, university and he was, he was giving this, uh, he was getting interviewed by these college journalists and this girl was just terrified of him, petrified, shaking. <laughs> it took her like five minutes to get out this very simple question, which basically said, some of your books seem to have uh, darker settings and other books tend to have settings that are more like light and sunny. And she's not even talking about like the themes. She's talking about just the actual physical environments. <laughs> and she says, why is that? And I was, I was practically cringing on her behalf because, I mean, I just sat down and had this sort of like, you know, aggressive adversarial interview with him. You know, he, his reactions, I wasn't bringing it in that way. He was just coming back at me hard. And, <laughs> and I was thinking, he's going to rip this poor girl apart. I mean, that's just a stupid question, right? But he took it as an opportunity to teach. He took it as an opportunity to um, interpret the question in such a way that made it look like she had really penetrated to the heart of his books and, and ends up giving this like 10, 12 minute lecture on light and dark and and themes and so forth and uh, you know I, w I was there with my wife and we'd been married a few months before and uh <laughs> and she and you know she just said wow he's he's really a a great teacher and i said you have no idea you know <laughs> he didn't do that with me but um so it was it was interesting um no actually i've never noticed um I've never noticed the high IQ to be depressed. Um, I have a number of, of very high IQ friends and acquaintances. Um, and uh, with one possible exception, none of them have any depressive qualities at all. So, um, you know, they, they do tend to be, I mean, I have to say that the most effective um, highly intelligent folks um, tend to be very good at presenting a, a, a artificial public face. I won't even call it a false face because it's consistent, but they tend to understand the importance of, um, of you know, just uh, sharing the interests of, of regular people and so forth. You know, for example, um, like I find myself often when I'm in a social situation, we were, we were on vacation recently and met some new people and I will find myself talking an awful lot about um, Real Madrid or uh, baby metal, you know, um, and talk about why I love baby metal. You know, nobody minds that. You know, they, they, they might laugh at you. They might think it's funny. Uh, they might think it's great, but you know, that's something that it, it's a, it's a subject that is accessible to anyone. Um, oh, I, I, I play soccer. I play veteran soccer at a, I actually played veteran soccer at a pretty high level over here for a while. Um, heck, I was playing two weeks ago against somebody who's played against Real Madrid. <laughs> um, I read some Evola. Um, I'll have to have another whack at it. I, I was, I did not enjoy it 
or find it particularly insightful, but I didn't read very much of it and I was reading it on my phone at the gym. So um, I've found that some stuff I can read at the gym, other stuff, other stuff I can't. Um, that was definitely in the... Uh, also, I, I think I would prefer just to read them in Italian. Um, when I can read in the original language, I prefer to do so. Um, you know, if I can read Echo in Italian, I'm sure I can read Ebola. Um, but anyhow, uh, you know, and, and I think one of the most um, difficult things when with, with intelligence is that it's very hard for anyone to speak honestly or openly about it because, um, you know, first of all, people love to chime in and say, you know, say we and you know, we smart people, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the thing is, half of them are posing. You know, half of them are, you know, I mean, it's kind of funny. You feel like, you feel like kind of going, um, yeah, I understand you want to think there's a we here, but you know, there isn't. It's, it's not like that. And so, um, and, and, you know, I understand the impulse. There's nothing wrong with it. But, um, you know, if for some reason we can't talk openly about intelligence because it's too integral to people. It's too upsetting to people. And, um, you know, but also there is a, you know, when you're dealing with the intelligent, when, you know, when I'm dealing with my kids, um, one of them in particular, you know, I have to be, um, I have to be, uh, very careful to, on the one hand, try to build them up and help them. And on the other hand, crush any instinct towards intellectual arrogance. And so, um, you know, one of the best things for me, I think, was reading uh, Joseph Schumpeter's History of Economic Analysis when I was, I think, 20 years old. And I remember practically being brought to tears because I felt like, I, I felt so overwhelmed by this, the, this mass of erudition of, you know, just, it seems so beyond me. And like, how, how could anyone possibly know this much? And that sort of thing. Um, you know, and it's kind of funny, of course, because, you know, I read it again recently. And, you know, I still, I'm, I'm still amazed by the amount of effort he put in. But I'm also kind of amazed by how much, how much bullshit there was in it. And so, um, so it was good. It was good from a, a hum, you know, from a humility perspective. I think humility is intellectual humility is absolutely vital. I think it um, is, and, and the more intelligent you are, the more important it is. Uh, it was definitely a progression. Um, I was, I was always what I called a Christian libertarian, and I was also always uh, a nationalist libertarian. Um, I understood instinctively the intrinsic problem with um, the intrinsic problem of libertarianism, uh, but I never really thought through the whole thing. You know, now I regard it kind of the way that communists regard communism. Um, it's an ideal, uh, but it is it is a um, unattainable ideal. You know, I mean, it's basically like um, like love. My philosophy is not inspired by Nietzsche at all. Um, I'm not a, I've, I've read a fair amount of Nietzsche. I'm totally unimpressed by it. And I think my favorite dismissal of Nietzsche is Robert Anton Wilson's, where he talks about um, an infinity of Nietzsche's, uh, contemplating an infinity of spiders in the moonlight. Um, and he reaches the conclusion that Nietzsche masturbates too much. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, that was a that was an effective rebuttal. Um, anyhow, in terms of um, writing more philosophy, I mean, I'm, I'm working on SJW's Always Double Down. That is a work of political philosophy. Now, it's, it's more applied philosophy, certainly, um, and I would like to do something that is more um, uh, 
theoretical, more integral, but you know, I've got an awful lot of things to write. Um, I'm, I'm working on Alt-Right Revolution with a co-writer, and that's going to be something that we hope will be sort of a, um, a, core, a core work that the Alt-Right can use as a reference, as a starting point. Again, I'm not attempting to tell anyone what something is. I'm not attempting to lead anyone anywhere. Um, I am simply, uh, I tend to regard myself as more a political taxonomist rather than any sort of creator. You know, the zebra existed before zoologists called it a zebra. The okapi existed before anybody knew that the okapi was around. So, you know, the people who named the zebra and discovered the okapi and that sort of thing, they didn't create it. They simply observed it and gave it a name so that now people can talk meaningfully about zebras and okapis. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm simply trying to observe what is there, observe the intellectual strains that are there, and then um, give people the language that is necessary in order to describe it. You know, that's why, I mean, when, when people talk about, you know, Richard Spencer named the alt-right. I mean, first of all, that's not really correct. All he did was abbreviate the alternative right that someone else gave the name to. Fine, you know, but we can, we can still give him credit for that, that's fine. But the point is, you know, who do you consider to be more influential when it comes to socialism? Karl Marx or Saint-Simon? But Saint-Simon named it. So what? Marx's version of socialism is much more influential. So, anyhow, um, I have now completely, um, on my very first... <laughs> My, first, my very first attempt, I've completely gone well over the 20 minutes I intended to do. But um, anyhow, uh, so just to, to reiterate, if you're, if you're buying games from GOG, please do so through um, Infogalactic. Um, if you're not supporting Infogalactic, I hope that you'll consider joining the burn unit, um, or at least letting people know that it exists and, and encourage them to start using it instead of Wikipedia. So have a good evening and hopefully we will see you soon. Thanks.